the, uh, found this passage very applicable today as we're dealing with the coronavirus. Uh, there's also a disease in the Bible that caused many of the same social constrictions that we face um, today. You know, lovers, they were ostracized from the community. Um, you know, I feel bad for those who are watching um, that may have coronavirus or, or separated because of it. And certainly we can all relate to this, uh, to the struggle, uh, because when, when, whenever you have a, this kind of disease that's contagious, you're, you're required to be ostracized and, and uh, quarantined. Um, and leprosy, for those who don't know, um, is a skin disease, skin disease that spreads very quickly and very easily. Uh, we, we can flip back to Leviticus, and God is establishing his, his community, uh, his nation of people to be set apart to him. He talks about what to do with people that are leprous. Um, and the priests uh, are the determining factor. They, they're the ones who determine if someone has leprosy. Uh, Leviticus 13, the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, when a person has on the skin of his body a swelling or an eruption of a spot, and it turns into a case of leprosy, uh, then he will be brought to Aaron, the priest, or to one of his sons, the priests, and the priests will examine the diseased area and determine if it's leprosy or not. It, you know, there's a description of all the symptoms of if you have this but you don't have this, it's okay. Um, and the priest is the one who makes the determination if you have it or not. And he goes on, when the priest has examined him, he will pronounce him clean or unclean. Uh, and then he gives a few more symptoms. The priest, if he has so many symptoms, the priest will shut him up, the diseased person, for seven days. Uh, and the priest shall examine him on the seventh day. And if in his eyes the diseased is slowed down, hasn't spread, you'll put him away for another seven days. It's a total of two weeks. We have two weeks quarantine as well if you're exposed to the coronavirus. Funny how that worked out. And on the seventh day again, he will examine him. If the diseased area has faded or if it's not spread at all, then the, the priest will pronounce him clean. It's only a little breakout. But if it's gotten worse, then the priest will make the determination that the man has leprosy. We read on in, in Leviticus 13 what the leprous person was condemned to do, to do what he was to, um, to do to protect everyone else from his uncleanness. The leprous person who has the disease shall wore, wear torn clothes, let the hair of his head hang loose. It's a, it's a way of identifying yourself in a social construct. And he shall cover his upper lip and cry out, unclean, unclean. We're all covering our upper lips right now. Very, very similar application for a contagious disease. And this is where it gets difficult. He shall remain unclean as long as he has the disease. He is unclean. He will live alone. His dwelling will be outside the camp. So not only was it a physical problem, but it also had implications of a spiritual problem. When, when someone is unclean, they were unfit to be in God's presence. And they didn't want that disease to be spread or that sinfulness to be spread to other people. And also, when he's outside of the camp, it's, out of being, it's an indication of being out of right relationship with God. And we are all, at one point, before knowing Christ, we all were out of right relationship with God, were we not? And also, not only was he living outside the camp, but he had no social interactions. He couldn't see his family. He couldn't, you know, hang out and go to his favorite restaurant. That would make me really sad, not going to Chick-fil-A. And it was a condemnation. There was no cure for leprosy. It was, there still is, you can slow the symptoms maybe, but there's no cure for it. So this is a lifelong ostracism. In, in, in Numbers, this is a better description. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Command the people of Israel that they put out of the camp everyone who is leprous or has a discharge and everyone who is unclean throughout contact with the dead. You will put out both male and females, putting them outside the camp that they may not defile the camp in the midst of which I dwell. God dwelled with his people, and he did not want any unclean things, spiritually or physically, in his camp. And we all can relate to this. Jesus, in the, um, at the end, when he says, he gives a clue that the skin disease he's talking about in this story is more than just a skin disease. It's also an indication of a spiritual state. And so we can all relate to that, because we all are sinful in some way. 
all have fallen short of the glory of God. We are all gone our own way in our, in our sinfulness. And so Jesus gives us a little clue at the end that this is also an indication of a spiritual um, construct. So as we relate to this passage as sinners, we will realize that God desires that we be empowered to live a victorious Christian life by prioritizing the making of praise unto him for bringing his healing to our lives through the work of Christ. I pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this time we can come together and study your word. Uh, thank you for it being living and active and very applicable to even today. And we ask that you speak through it in Jesus' name. Amen. What does someone preach about on the Sunday that he's being recognized as ordained? Well, you get over yourself and you preach through, um, you know, it's not about me or anything like that. It's about what God's word is saying. And so I'm continuing the story in Luke and come to find out it's very applicable to what's happening today. Uh, in the last couple of, of two sermons, we've talked about a huddle servant and, and things that the Christian life does. Uh, the first couple of verses of 17, he talks about the need to forgive so much. And then he talks about the unworthy servants who just, I'm just a servant doing my job. That's a hard standard to do. Forgiving someone seven times a day and being an unworthy servant in the kingdom of God is a hard thing to do. So Jesus is going to give us some empowerment, some motivation to do those difficult Christian things. Verse 11, there's a uh, uh, context. There's a lot of different cities named. So I encourage you to look in your map, the back of your Bible, or if you have a phone, you can Google it, Jesus map, or Palestine in the time of Jesus, uh, so that you can understand just where's, what's happening uh, in this passage. So flip to the back of your Bible. Most Bibles have it. Uh, mine says Palestine under the Roman rule. Um, and you, if you'll see that on, you got the Jordan River. On this side, you have Galilee, Samaria, and Judea. And on this side of the Jordan River, you have Decapolis and Perea. And no one really liked the Samaritans here in the middle because they're kind of considered half-breeds. And so a lot of times to go from Galilee to Jerusalem, which is in Judea, they would kind of cut across through Perea following the Jordan River and come up the giant mountains into um, uh, Jericho and then on into um, Jerusalem to, to celebrate the Passover feast, which is what we see happening here. In, in a couple other verses from now, uh, in 1835, verse, chapter 18, verse, verse 45, 35, he says that Jesus is drawing near to Jericho. And then again, in 19, he says it's, he entered Jericho and is passing through. And then in 1928, he says, and when he had said these things, he went on ahead going to Jerusalem. What's going on in the, in the context of this passage is that he is joining a throng of people, a big a uh, caravan of people as they go on their way to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover feast. Um, it's kind of like here in Columbia, you know when game day is for the Carolina game Con. It's not necessarily because you're a fan, but because of the traffic, right? You know what roads are going to be super blocked up until so you avoid them. Or if you're trying to go to the game, you get on those, those highways to get there quickly. And that's what Jesus was doing. And as he went, he was teaching. And at this point in the story, in the narrative of Luke, he only has one to three months left in his life. Uh, in chapter 19 or 20, as he's going into Jerusalem, that's the triumphal entry where he is going to be crucified. He knows he's going there. Throughout the story of Luke, the phrase, as he was going to Jerusalem, is one of his, Luke's, driving narratives that helps move the narrative along to show that Jesus, is, his entire life is spent looking towards Jerusalem, looking towards the Passion Week, where he will suffer for our sins. As he's going, he's teaching his disciples about the Christian life. He, he was pressing on, knowing what lay ahead of him. He was not surprised by the crucifixion that happened. He was determined to press on. And as he went, he was teaching his disciples about the Christian life that they were about to live because he would be gone. And again, in, in the previous verses of chapter 17, he talks about forgiveness. That's a tough thing to do. They, they ask, Lord, increase our faith. And then, and then they talk about uh, being a humble servant in the kingdom of God. Those are hard Christian things to do. So, again, Jesus is going to give us the empowerment, the motivation to prioritize and, and, and to help us live that good Christian life. Verse 13, or excuse me, 
continuing in verse 11, he's passing between Samaria and Galilee. When he says he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee, it makes you think he's like going on the border of the two. But really, he's like going from, Samaria, from Galilee to Samaria, like going from North Carolina to South Carolina. He's, he's crossing that border with this huge throng of people that he's teaching. He has been teaching for chapters now. Uh, Don Howell said that he is now joining the pilgrims, making their way south to Jerusalem for Passover by way of Perea and Jericho, uh, as we explained a minute ago. So going on to verse 12. The, the village isn't identified, which is fun. Um, and, and you notice that uh, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance. Right? They were social distancing by like 30 feet. And they all cried out uh, in, in one voice. They were, they were properly social distanced. Now, we, we already heard the story. And so we know that one of the guys is a Samaritan and that the rest are Jews. Now, Jews and Samaritans, we know... They didn't get along. The Jews hated the Samaritans, but they were all united. These ten men were united by their leprosy. Uh, there's a guy named, Hed an author named Hendrickson, uh, who gives a lot of different characteristics of how all these men are united under, one, or, uh, under different causes. And so I'll read it, and then I'll unpack it as I go afterwards again. He says, note in how many respects these ten men are alike. They are all afflicted with the dreadful disease, leprosy. All were determined to do something about it. All had heard about Jesus and believed that he might be able to cure them, at the very least take pity on them. They all appealed to Jesus, acknowledging him as master or rabbi. All, in obedience to Christ's commands, proceed on their way to the priests. And also all are healed. But at this point, the simil similarity ends. That which is different between the nine Jews and the one Samaritan determines that these things that are uniting them actually set the nine apart. There's different characteristics. Uh, he lists these characteristics, but really they all have different motivations for doing these things that united them. So now we're going to un un unpack those things just for a minute. What differentiates the nine, and oftentimes ourself, is the priority that drives them to do these things that united them. They were all afflicted with dreadful disease. They all recognized that they had a problem. Yes, they were miserable. <laughs> and so often we ourselves recognize that we are not necessarily good people. We realize, we feel bad that we are sinful, that we're not in a good state with God, that we are probably condemned to hell. They were all afflicted with this dreadful disease. And so their priority was to get some kind of ease of their pain. Their focus was themselves. That was their priority. And so often when we come to Jesus, it's for our own, own needs, to get our own satisfaction met and take care of ourselves. They were all determined to do something about it. They recognized that there was need, that they were uncomfortable, that in their current state it wasn't a fun place to be, and we also have been there. Um, number three. All had heard about Jesus and believed that he could maybe do something for them. Isn't that right? We all know who Jesus is. Everyone in South Carolina knows at least the name of Jesus, if not just take it just enough to take it in, the, in vain, use it as a curse word, right? And so often I, I see Facebook posts of um, uh, claiming victory in the name of Jesus over cancer. Um, applying to Jesus just to have one's own needs met. Uh, everyone knows of Jesus, but we use him for personal satisfactions, wanting only what we want. Cleansing from sins. Yes, we want cleansing from sin. That's a good thing to want, but there's something more. There's something a little bit more that we need. Oftentimes that drives us to have some kind of spiritual moment where we all cry out to Jesus, yes, please, Lord, save me, where we recognize Jesus as creator of all things. And even they take action. It takes, we can take steps to be generally affiliated with the church, sealing the deal, making sure that we have our salvation, that we're good for life. And that could involve being baptized, becoming a church member. And, and this, is, this one is kind of a hard thing for me to do because they all, in obedience to Christ's commands, do what they were told to do. Like, but why does he condemn them for doing what 
that he told them to do. Jesus told them to go sell yourself to the priest. So why is he saying they were foolish not come back and give thanks to God? What's up with that? It's a matter of priorities, mixed up priorities. You saying, I do the things God wants me to do for me, having myself as priority. These guys were only focused on themselves in their current condition, their sinful, diseased condition, and relieving themselves of the condition. We can recognize that we're sinful and that we need to be relieved of it, but we still are missing a main priority. We're missing one of the points that the, main, the one guy got. And oftentimes, uh, there's a perception of healing. Um, these guys, they wanted their physical flesh healed, but the true need, the true need was that they needed a spiritual healing, which we all need. And Jesus gave a clue that, that this is a spiritual reality he's talking about, that, that, that we need. We can all realize that we're sinful, but if we're missing something else, the, a characteristic of the one guy, and we haven't quite sealed the deal. Don Howell again says, these guys have been restored to community. Shame and ostracism removed. A painful, disfiguring condition healed. They turned no longer to Jesus after relief was provided. Because you also got to think, these guys have been quarantined for years and years and years and years. What would be your priority? You know, if you have COVID for most of your life, and you've been in quarantine most of your life, living on the outskirts of town, living in the boonies, surviving only off of the charity of maybe some people who drop a crust of bread by your side, not willing to touch you, wanting social interaction, what would be your priority if someone says, go get a nose swab? It'll come back negative. Okay, so yes, I'm going to go get my nose swab. And as they're walking, they realize that their diseased skin is being healed. Like, yes, let's hurry up. Press the gas pedal. That's what we would do, right? If you have the coronavirus and suddenly you stop coughing, you lose your fever, you're going to hurry up, go to the doctor, get that nose swab as uncomfortable as it can be so you can get back to your normal life, so you can get back to being comfortable and, 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 having your, and living out the fact that you have been cleansed, which is not necessarily a bad thing, right, because you want that. And, yes, God does want that for us, but there's something missing in these men's lives. There's a missing priority. It's easy to say we're not in this camp, that yes, my priority is Jesus. I do the things God wants me to do. I'm a good Christian. I know that. But we haven't gotten to the description of the one yet. So verse 14. When he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. This is a little bit different from the uh, passage in Luke 5, where Jesus heals a leprous man by touching him. And the God is clean. No, from a distance, he just says, go. He didn't, a lot of times when Jesus does a miracle, he does something. He puts something on the eyes of the blind man, he covers the ears of the deaf man, or something like that. No, this time he just says, go. Uh, in, in Leviticus 14, as we read, the priests were the authority. They were the ones who would administer the tests. They were the ones who de would determine this guy has leprosy or not. So what would you do? Would you rush to rush to the doctor in order to go home, or would you return to the guy who said, go get another swab, and thank him for healing you? That's what the one guy did, the Samaritan. So now we're going to get into characteristics of the one guy, the guy who Jesus said did the right thing. Verse 15, then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He fell at his face, fell on his face, giving thanks to Jesus. Now, this man was a Samaritan. He was an outsider. You know, the Jews were supposed to have, like, an understanding of the big picture. They were supposed to know that salvation was coming through Jesus, through God, but they didn't get it. Their priority was on themselves and getting their flesh healed. This guy realized the bigger picture. Whatever he knew about God, he was a Samaritan, wasn't necessarily the best the theologian. Whatever he knew about God, he caught, he caught on to the fact that there was a big picture in play, that God was working on the earth through this man to bring about his kingdom, not his own. His priority was on God, praising God. And so often it's easy for us to want to 
you know, get our needs met. And, okay, yes, I'm not sinful anymore. Yes, I feel better. I can live life without fear. But is our priority praising God for what he has done? And that's where that tension of Jesus told him to do it, that's where that tension is resolved. The priority should always be praising God for what he has done in our lives. Uh, in verse 19, Jesus says, your faith has healed you. This man was trusting the bigger picture. He saw the bigger picture. He was applying himself to the fact that God is working on the earth through this man for his own glory. I love Jesus' concern. The man was praising God, not Jesus. He was praising God for the work that was done, for his acts of redemption. And so also, so also should we praise God for his actual rede- acts of redemption through Jesus. And Jesus' response is great. We're not ten cleansed, where are the nine? Was no one bound to return and give praise to God? Not praise me, Jesus, but praise to God. Jesus realized that he was a messenger. Um, Jesus' concern, priority, Jesus has priorities, right? Was for God's glory, not his own. He was sent from God. Uh, Michael Card, well, let me flip to Hebrews, uh, Hebrews 1. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, through um, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through, who also he created the world. Jesus was the tool, the messenger. God spoke through Jesus. In John 1, the word became flesh. God would speak, God would speak to the prophets, to the world. Jesus spoke final word, which is Jesus. The word, John 1 tells us, became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus, re- Jesus had his priorities straight because he wasn't concerned about his own glory. He was concerned about the glory of the Father. So he gives an example as well. Michael Card says this, When the Father's wisdom wanted to communicate his love, he spoke it in one final, perfect word. He spoke the incarnation, and then so was born a son. His final word was Jesus. He needed no other one. Jesus also had his priorities straight, because he was more concerned about glorifying God the Father, making sure that God the Father had the glory and not himself. Uh, And he also says, this foreigner, is he addressing the, the, the Samaritan when he says that? No, he's addressing his disciples. He was using this as a chance at a, uh, a illustration, a teaching point for his disciples. This foreigner got right. Where is the rest of the people? And, and I love it. that. To me, that's the heart of a pastor. He's like, did you not just see God doing this great and miracle thing in the world? Did, didn't you just see this? Where is the response? Come on, people. <laughs> Respond to God. Give praise to God for the wondrous things that he has done, for bringing about our salvation, for loving us so much, for cleansing us of our sins. Through Christ. So what does God want want from us in our lives as a response? What is the right response to God's grace in our lives? We we should prioritize giving praise to God. We should prioritize giving praise to God. Everything is a gift from God. Each each day is a gift from God. And, And this is a daily struggle, right? We should daily rejoice in our salvation. We should always be grateful for everything that he has given us. Every little blessing is, is, is from God. Now, this is not a one-and-done deal, right? It's a, it's, it's a daily sanctification that you have to work through. It's daily because who's perfect? Adelaide might be perfect. That's it. No one's perfect, so we have to do this daily in order to be more like God. Jesus, uh, in the model prayer, says, Give us this day our daily bread. Daily sustainment. And that's only done by the first part of the the, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus, even in in that model prayer, is encouraging that we prioritize God's will over our own needs and wishes. And this is only done. We we, We can do the thing God wants us to do. We can try our best to forgive as much as we can, to be a humble servant, as we as Jesus talked about in, in chapter 17. 
But that's really hard to do without good motivation. That's really hard to do. And so the empowerment God has given us is love. The love of God, rejoicing in God every morning, every day. We had to place God's will as before our own, rejoicing in salvation, repenting. God, I'm a sinful person. I, I can't do this life without you. I need you, Lord. Please. Coming to the cross each day, recognizing our need for him, our, our need for daily sustainment. Give us this day our daily bread. Jesus also said, take up your cross daily and follow me. The Christian life is a daily struggle for which we need daily rejoicing, daily prioritizing. In the wilderness, um, when the Israelites were in the wilderness, God gave them food enough for one day. They tried to keep the food for another day. It wouldn't quite work. The food would go bad. They needed to trust God each day for sustainment. And then in verse 19, Jesus said, go on your way. Um, your faith has made you well. The, the phrase made you well is the hint that I talked about earlier. It indicates more of a spiritual nature to, to this discussion that Jesus is having. The, many of your Bibles have a footnote uh, that on the made you well part. It's indicating a wholeness. Your faith has saved you. This guy got the bigger picture that God is working in the world. And because of this, Jesus was able to bring about his salvation in his life. That is the bigger picture that the man had caught. God wants us to be grateful to him each day, prioritizing his will above our own each day, loving him each day, rejoicing in our salvation each day. The Christian life is only doable, doing these things that he talked about, forgiving and being a humble servant, is only doable when you're in a right, right relationship with Jesus Christ. I'll close with this um, the hymn. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. A tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need thee every hour, stay thou nearby. Temptations lose their power when thou art nigh. I need thee, oh, I need thee, every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to thee. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for your word. Uh, that you have spoken through Jesus Christ. Um, help us come to you with our hearts more than just our actions. Help us to love you with our hearts, not just follow you with what we say and do as Christians. Father, empower us as we go out. Empower us with your love. Help us focus on you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Thank you, Daniel. Appreciate that. We have, uh, as, as you know, we have been walking through the Gospel of Luke, um, and I appreciate Daniel continuing that sequence. Uh, Pastor Ken will be uh, continuing again there next week. If you'd like to respond to this, as we say each week, uh, we have a place on our website that you can get in contact with us. You can, uh, we'll hang around up here front if you want to come and and respond to us after the service is over, uh, we do want you to respond. We don't want that just to be uh, some words because just like Daniel said, we need the saving power and the sustaining power of Jesus every hour and every day. And uh, so thank you, brother. I appreciate that so much. There's something that uh, we have been planning on doing for about four months, so if you'll just bear with me for just a minute. Uh, we actually have uh, started the process with ordaining Daniel uh, back in about January, and we kind of, Ken and I, talked with him and, and worked with him and spoke with him and supported him, and, and um, then we had an ordina ordination council that met with Daniel uh, in March or February, March, early March. And so the, the, he was very impressive in that council. And then I, I kind of uh, liken this to asking your girlfriend to marry you, and then they wait four months to give you an answer. Um, so we're finally ready to give an answer. 
so <laughs> uh, no, the the, uh, the advisory council was uh, the uh, ordination council was was very impressed with Daniel. As of course uh, they already knew him, and uh, but they had a chance to hear from him. We had some questions that kind of uh, asked him to 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 defend where he stood on some biblical things, on some societal things, and uh, other, other ways. So that, that is the biblical role of the church. The, the church is to, to set aside and to set apart uh, individuals to, for service. And so that is what we are doing. And as, as Beulah Baptist Church, we are doing that. So let me read you the certificate, and then we want to affirm him Normally, we would have a, a, a service where we could come by and lay hands on on um, on Daniel, uh, but in in our circumstances we can't, and they are soon to be moving uh, into the Augusta Savannah area, and um, so we wanted to do this sooner rather than than wait another four months before we could do this. So. Uh, this is the oath that, that the council is providing and, and affirmation from you guys, Beulah Baptist Church. We, the undersigned, upon the recommendation and request, the Beulah Baptist Church at Hopkins, South Carolina, which had full and sufficient opportunity for judging the God-given gifts and after satisfactory examination by us in regard to the Christian experience, call to the ministry and views of Bible doctrine, hereby certify that Daniel Thomas Maggard was solemnly and publicly set apart and ordained to the work of the gospel ministry by the authority and the order of the pastor of Beulah Baptist Church and the congregants of Beulah Baptist Church. So Daniel, come up here, brother. Let us encourage you. This has been a wonderful couple for, for us. How long have you guys been here now? Four, four years? About four years. Uh, just an impressive couple, uh, just uh, great hearts, great service to our community, a great family. It's good to see this family together. I appreciate you guys being here. Uh, but, you know, I, the only way I know to affirm him is just let's clap and just give him some love. <laughs> We are very proud of, of the, the, the growth that we've seen in Daniel. We're very proud of the future that, that he will have in serving the kingdom, whether that's as an army chaplain or whether that is a pastor or whether that's a church planner or whatever that may be, and he leading God's people. But um, there is precedent in the Bible about laying hands in, in some parts of the Bible uh, when, when a person was set apart. They laid hands, and in other parts of the of the stories, uh, they set apart people, and they did not lay hands. Uh, so I, I think we are fulfilling our biblical uh, obligations here. Uh, but I just want to affirm Adelaide, come up here, so so they can see you as well. Uh, this is not only an affirmation of of this couple, but it is also an opportunity for us to send them, uh, since this is probably. They're, the last week we'll see them for a while. Thankfully, their family is here, and that's a great pull for them to come back. So you guys have to be here every week, too, so that they'll come back to, uh, to see us every once in a while. But, but I just want to affirm them. I want you to affirm them. Send them some emails. Send them uh, some encouragement as they make this move of, of faith in their lives and, and go down to the coast uh, uh, and 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 serve the Lord there. The church is not just Beulah Baptist. It is it is a universal church. And guys, we are so proud of you. We love you. We are here to support you. That document says that we endorse your ministry, and we support who you are, and we support who you are in the Lord. And uh, so, just thank them one more time for for the. Thank you. Thank you. Kind of mentioned giving life update. Last time we kind of got up here and, and told us told y'all what's going on. We were going to work at a children's home. Well, that children's home has since transitioned from a organized children's home to a fostering community, uh, which ultimately has kind of put us out of a job, which is fine. Uh, the the need was there, and um, 
So we've been hanging out in Columbia for a little bit. Um, so the, the facility of like six or seven buildings has um, changed down to three buildings that are actual houses with actual parents caring for the kids in actual foster homes, which in my opinion is better than a group home. Um, so now we're going to Augusta. We're moved, packing up Friday, and we're going to Augusta so I can finish up some education requirements. So yeah. we love you guys. We're going to sell too. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you, Brad. We appreciate it. Appreciate all that's that's been done. We we hopefully have a baby this week, uh, so uh, we can. Aren't you glad you're not nine months pregnant? Yeah, yeah. So we'll celebrate that. Hopefully, it's toward the end of the week uh, this week, and uh, praying for Reese. And um, so l let me s just say, some of you are back for the first time. Thank you for being here. Uh, we're glad that you. We are slowly beginning to, to gather again. Guys online, thank you for being so faithful for gathering uh, each week. Uh, let me remind you that we will dis we're going to sing a song, and at the end of that song, we're going to dismiss you from the back to the front, so wait for the usher to come down the aisle. And as you leave the aisle, if you would leave your tithe in that box, we would appreciate it. It's been a good day. Thank you, Daniel. Appreciate your words, brother. And we look forward to you joining us for Bible school starting tomorrow. Starting tomorrow. All right, let's stand and we'll sing together.